Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. We should probably get going uh, so we uh, don't miss out on anything today. First, I uh, hope you've all had a good first day at TechEd New Zealand. I hope you've already all learned something new. Um, and I also hope you're planning to come to the uh, Welcome Expo at the end of this. Uh, I'll certainly be there and hope to chat to you all there. Uh, I'm Ben Armstrong, uh, Senior Program Manager Lead at Microsoft. I work on the, the Hyper-V team. Uh, and today I'm here to talk about uh, dynamic memory and Hyper-V uh, and what it is, how it works, and why you want to be playing with it. So uh, let's jump in. The first thing I want to talk about is to set the stage and explain some of our motivation behind uh, how and why we built dynamic memory. Uh, now, I would be pretty remiss if I were to do this session and not say, yes, part of our motivation was we have a competitor out there who has similar uh, sorts of functionality. And certainly, uh, VMware with their memory overcommit was a part of why we started looking into what we could do for advanced memory management. Uh, the interesting thing was that, and, and for just a bit of context for you guys, we try very hard to not you know, just go running after VMware when they do something. Because if you do that, nine times out of 10, you build the wrong thing. So instead, when we see VMware doing something, we go out and we talk to our customers. And we try and find out what's working for them, what's not working for them, what they like, what they don't like, and what problems they're trying to solve. Uh, and we've been looking at this space for quite a while. Uh, as uh, I'll get into details as we get on, we've been looking at uh, different things we can do around memory management since about 2005 now. Um, but in talking to customers, there are a couple of really interesting things that uh, came to light. Uh, the first one is this interesting fact. No one can size the memory for their virtual machine correctly. Uh, and when I say that, I'm not being like an ivory tower Microsoft guy going like, all you guys are losers and don't know what to do. I include myself, and I include all Microsoft people in that category, because the funny thing is, you can choose any Microsoft product and come up with you know, an imaginary workload, go to that product team and ask them how much memory that workload needs. You know, say, hey, I'm setting up a file server. It's going to have 300 users. It's going to serve about 20 gig of data a day. Uh, the usage pattern is going to be this. Go to the file server team and ask them, how much memory is that box going to need? And they're going to sit there going, um, hmm, hmm. Um, so no one can really do a good job of sizing these servers. And beyond the, the initial sizing problem, no one can really give good definitive answers about how, memory, how performance will be affected if you go and change the sizing. You know, you have a server, it's running well today. But what would happen if you doubled the memory for that box? You know, we all know there are workloads out there where if you throw memory at them, they get faster. And there are workloads where if you throw memory at them, nothing happens. Oh, similarly, what if you took that workload that's running well and halved the memory? You know, maybe it doesn't need that memory. Maybe you're wasting memory. Uh, people don't have these answers. And in talking to users, getting beyond the, OK, no one can size virtual machines, we get to the next point, which is no one wants to size virtual machines. I know very, very few people who would say that their number one job description is tweaking and tuning their virtualization platform in order to get the best performance and consolidation ratio possible. Most people are employed to do something else. And virtualization is just the tool that they're using to do that something else. From that aspect, they don't want to spend this time, all this tuning. They have other, more important work to do. So here are some great quotes uh, that I've actually heard from customers as I've been talking about memory management. Uh, the top one is actually the most common one. Uh, this, you know, new virtual machines get a gig of RAM, and the way I size memory is through user complaints. You know, if a user complains, they get more memory. If they don't complain, they don't get more memory. Uh, and this is great. And we all know that under this system, you've got users out there who are suffering, but they're just too timid to come and complain to you. Uh, the second one I only heard once. And I did actually have someone say, all new virtual machines get 4 gig of RAM, and it's great. No one complains. And I sat there going, what sort of budget do you have that you can just waste resource like that and no one questions it? Uh, this, uh, the, the last point here I find really interesting. Uh, I would uh, 
I would happily take the A vendor here and replace it with Microsoft. Microsoft tells me their app needs four gig of RAM. I don't have the time to, find, to test this to find out whether it's true or not. Because uh, I can tell you in, in my time playing with uh, dynamic memory, I've found many Microsoft applications that run happily with far less memory than listed on the minimum memory. And I've been going around and I've been talking to the teams at Microsoft and I've found that nine times out of 10 when you get a Microsoft product and there's a label that says, no, this server workload minimum two gig of memory. What they're really saying is the smallest amount of memory we had a in a box in our test lab was two gig. And it seemed to work fine. So we're saying two gigs the minimum. So no one wants to do this job. Yet at the same time, memory has become a, a key bottleneck to getting the most out of your hardware with virtualization. Uh, for ages, the bottleneck was CPU. And we spent a lot of time, both in the software and in the hardware, working on addressing the CPU bottleneck. And these days, you know, Hyper-V is able to easily run you know, eight virtual processors per logical processor. Not a problem but I never talk to a customer who's running at that ratio. Most of the time when I talk to people using Hyper-V, they're more in the two to one, three to one, sometimes four to one, and most of the time what's stopping them is the memory. And uh, I've got an interesting thing, possibly the most expensive asset in the system. This is widely debated. The reason why I say it's the most expensive asset in the system is a lot of the time when I talk to customers and they're bottlenecked on memory, they're at the maximum capacity for the motherboard. You know, so it's not just to go out and buy more memory. They need a new motherboard. And heck, if you're going to get a new motherboard, your system's probably not going to boot on it because it has the wrong drivers and so on. And you don't know if all your peripheral devices are going to work, so you may as well go out and buy a new computer. And for most people, like when they hit the, the memory capacity, increasing that does mean getting a new computer. So in talking to users, there were a couple of clear expectations that came out. Uh, the first one was, you got to increase the VMs, but not the cost of performance. You know, there's no point in allowing me to run twice as many virtual machines if they now ran at half the speed. You know, that's, that's not useful. The next one uh, is, the performance needs to be predictable. This needs to be something that I can turn on and I can re leave running overnight and not worried that I'm going to come in the morning and find out that something's gone horrifically wrong um, with my system. And hand in hand with that, don't give us a feature that's dev test only. We're sick and tired of those. You know, either make it so you can turn it on everywhere or don't make it. So that leads us into dynamic memory, what we've ended up building uh, to address a lot of these needs and requirements. So out of those needs and requirements, we had a few high-level goals. Uh, obviously, we want to get higher consolidation ratio with minimal performance impact. We want a solution that works well for both servers and desktops. You know, a lot of people start looking at the memory technology and they think, ah, this is just a VDI thing. This is just for desktops. And we really wanted a solution that we could just say, nope, you got a virtual machine, you turn on dynamic memory. Done. Um, it needs to add minimal overhead to the system. You know, we don't want to be wasting resource. And the final one, and this has been uh, an interesting point of discussion on the team, is it needs to pass the that looks right test. And what I mean by this is, you know, it's one thing if you have a server and you thought it needed a gig and you turn dynamic memory on and, oh, look, it's using 1.5 gig. And you go and you do some uh, investigation and, oh, look, I'd, I'd undersize that system. It's another thing altogether if, that system's now using eight gig of RAM. You know, it needs to you know, look right, and you need to be able to look at what the system is doing, understand what's happening, and to be able to have some level of trust in the fact that it's doing the right thing with your virtual machines. So, at its core, what dynamic memory is about is about watching what's happening inside your virtual machines and being able to very quickly and responsively add and remove memory from virtual machines so that the memory is in the right place at the right time. The way I like to talk about this is it's allowing us to manage memory 
like we manage CPU today. You know, CPU is a resource that we can very quickly move around and we can allow you to pack uh, a lot of uh, virtual processes in there because we're moving the, the CPU around as needed. And we're aiming for the same thing with dynamic memory. And this has been kind of an interesting area of investigation for us because this is, this is one of the areas where we've been looking at this for a long time. So one thing that we haven't talked about until now is that we were actually looking at this technology and working on this technology when we were working on the initial release of Hyper-V. Uh, and in the initial release, even before we got to, to beta, uh, we looked at the problem of, you know, hey, we want to be able to move memory around. And we said, hey, the, the x86 architecture supports hot out of memory. So we're just going to modify our virtual machine to make it look like it supports hot out of memory. And that'll be great. You know, it's, it'll be really simple. We'll just do it in the virtualization layer. And, uh, you know, all our problems solved. And it turns out that that was a terrible approach. And it was a terrible approach for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first reason, uh, it's kind of amusing, is in order for traditional hot out of memory to work, uh, when the physical computer boots, the BIOS needs to report that it has an empty memory slot that's capable of receiving a, a new stick of memory. And for a physical computer, this is fine, because hot out in a physical computer you literally have one, maybe two spare memory slots, and they're there for your, you know, just in case. We're wanting to build this dynamic system where we're moving things all around, so we actually modified the virtual machine so that our motherboard reported that it had 4,096 memory slots on it. You can imagine some of the bugs that we found. You can imagine what device manager looked like uh, when you went into the virtual machine and started looking at this, you know, pages and pages and pages of memory devices. Uh, so that was the first issue, and as I said, we found a lot of interesting bugs. But the second issue uh, was one of responsiveness. Uh, now keep in mind that we're trying to build a system that's lightweight, minimal overhead, and one where we can see what's happening in a virtual machine and instantly respond uh, by providing more memory or taking memory away. Now, classical x86 hot out of memory uh, is actually a full plug and play event. And you can think about this as it's like plugging an unknown USB device into your computer. So what does this mean? One, it takes time. Uh, it takes anywhere from 5 to 15 seconds before the device shows up, in this case, the memory. Two, it takes a lot of CPU. You know, there's churning on the CPU while it's going through the whole plug and play routine. Uh, and three, and this is the kicker, is it actually goes and hits the disk. Because what it does is when it does a plug and play event, it goes and it looks through the Windows driver cache to try and find a driver for the device that just turned up. So keep in mind, this is something that we're wanting to do because your virtual machine is about to run out of memory. So your virtual machine is about to run out of memory. It's just started paging. We're going to pin the CPU. We're going to take 10 to 15 seconds, and we're going to hit the disk. Uh, no, like clearly not uh, a, a usable approach. Uh, so, as I said, we actually had that approach working, working, uh, in Hyper-V, uh, and we pulled it from Hyper-V before even the initial beta of Hyper-V, because we looked at this and went, no, this, this isn't going to meet the customer requirements. Um, and instead, we've been working on uh, a fully enlightened form uh, of hot add of memory. And this is a, a form of hot add of memory that's been designed specifically for virtual machines. And at the simplest level, what this looks like is we decide that we need to add memory to our virtual machine. We call down into the hypervisor. We extend the memory space for the virtual machine. And we send a message into the virtual machine that goes to the Windows kernel and says, don't ask how, don't ask why. There's more memory over there. Go use it. Um, so that's how we do hot app. Now, we'd originally wanted to do an enlightened form of hot remove of memory. Uh, and once again, this was something that we had up and running. Unfortunately, we just couldn't get it to work with the performance requirements that we had. Um, and the specific reason behind that is that while hot out of memory is something that exists in the hardware today, and as a result, we had a lot of work in place in the Windows kernel that understood this, hot remove does not exist. No, hot remove is not something that exists in the physical world. And we did a lot of work trying to invent 
part remove in, in the Windows kernel. And once again, we did have it working, just not at the performance levels that we wanted. So instead, in the current release, we're using a technique that's called ballooning. Uh, similar to what VMware does with their ballooning, where you have a driver inside the virtual machine, and when you want to take memory away, the driver inside the virtual machine requests kernel memory, and once it gets it, it sends a message over to us saying, I'm sitting on a chunk of memory, you can take it away. And a little side note, because I've had a couple of people ping me about this, we are going to continue to call this removing of memory, even though the technique we're using is ballooning. And there are two reasons for that. One, because the end result is we remove the memory, and two, because one day, we're hoping we can get back to the enlightened remove, and we can you know, properly be adding and removing. But and a really fascinating thing about these two approaches, as, as I've mentioned, uh, it's all about lightweight. And these two approaches are both so lightweight that we're able to be assessing the state of memory on the system and moving memory between virtual machines once a second. And so when you have dynamic memory and it's running, once a second, we are looking at what's happening and we are moving the, the memory around so that you can get the best performance and the best consolidation ratio out of the virtual machines. Now, obviously, dynamic memory is part of Service Pack 1. Um, a, a point that I've had a couple of people ask me about is it is supported in the free version of Hyper-V as well. Uh, one of the downsides of the enlightened approach is it means that we do have a very specific list of supported guest operating systems because for every operating system we support, we had to do this work to go in and do the enlightenment. Um, so on the server side, we're supporting Windows Server 2003 and later. Um, so 2003, 2003 R2, 2008, 2008 R2. That's 32-bit and 64-bit, and that's in the web standard enterprise and data center SKUs uh, of those products. On the desktop side, we're supporting Vista and Windows 7, 32-bit and 64-bit in the Enterprise and Ultimate uh, editions, which, by the way, that was a lot of fun talking to the licensing people and explaining why I wanted to enable a hot add memory feature in a desktop product. <laughs> there, were, there was a lot of explanation that had to go along with that. So now I want to go a bit deeper into the architecture and some of the concepts behind dynamic memory before I do a, a short demo. Uh, here is my obligatory block diagram. Uh, I often say that they don't let me out to do these talks unless I have the, the pretty block screen somewhere. Um, there are a couple of things that I would like to call out uh, on this block diagram. The first one is that we have this component over here that runs in the virtual machine now, which is the dynamic memory uh, VSC. And the key thing to note here is that, unfortunately, yes, you do need to update your integration services in order to get dynamic memory uh, in a virtual machine. Um, with, uh, if you're running Windows 7 or Windows Server 2008 R2, you actually have two choices for how to get the VSC in there. Either you can just update the integration services like you normally would, or you can install Service Pack 1 into the virtual machine. And Service Pack 1 will include the updated integration services along with that. Um, the other thing I like to discuss on this page is to discuss some of the, the security uh, questions that come up around dynamic memory. The, the biggest concern that people have around dynamic memory is they look at this and they go, okay, first one, is there any way now that, since you're moving all this memory around, is there any way that information can leak from one virtual machine to another? Uh, and the answer is no, and it's a very easy and simple answer to give because thankfully we're building on top of a system that already does this well. We're building on top of Windows. Uh, and so what we actually do is when we get memory out of a virtual machine, we just free it in the parent partition via the Windows memory manager. And this is just like memory moving between two processes under Windows normally. And the Windows memory manager has all the appropriate protection and scrubbing routines where it, it ensures that that memory is clean. And then when we want to add memory, we grab it back from the free pool in the Windows memory manager in the parent partition. Um, so that's very simply answered. The next question we uh, get is, so what sort of protections do you have to stop a rogue virtual machine from trying to chew up all the memory and take memory away from other virtual machines? Uh, the first thing to understand is that virtual machines 
do not request memory. Um, that's not the way this architecture is built. What actually happens is each virtual machine reports a bunch of statistical information about here's what my memory needs are, here's, you know, here's my current paging activity, here's my committed memory level, and a couple of other details. And each virtual machine reports that information, and that actually gets sent up over here to the memory balancer uh, in the VMMS. And the memory balancer then takes these statistics from each of the virtual machines, figures out where the memory is best placed. And then it conducts the add and remove operations in order to, to get that. Um, and as I mentioned, it's doing this uh, once every second. The uh, other half of the answer to that is, and I'll show this in the demo, is we have some controls like you can set maximum limits, you can set relative weights that allow you to say, this virtual machine is less trusted than that virtual machine, and change how memory is distributed. Next, I just want to talk about a concept that I get, I get a lot of questions about, and this is memory availability. Um, we talk about you know, what the memory availability is of a system running dynamic memory. And in a nutshell, the idea here is that while a virtual machine is running and you've got services starting and stopping, you've got applications starting and stopping, um, its memory needs are going to change dynamically as it's running. And what we do is we are constantly looking at what is this virtual machine's memory needs and how much memory does it have? And the availability is a, is a percentage that we, we report, which is compared to how much this virtual machine needs, how much above or below is it you know, how, compared to the memory it has? I have some examples there. I won't step into them, but that's the, that's the concept. We then have a, an availability is the term that we use in the UI. It has a, a partner concept, which we don't use in the UI, but we do use in the performance counters, which is pressure. And once again, this is measuring the same concept, the where is this virtual machine at compared to where does it need to be at. Uh, the difference here is it's just a different calculation. And here, a virtual machine that's got more memory than it needs is below 100% pressure. A virtual machine that's at 100% has exactly the memory it needs, and the virtual machine that's over 100% needs more memory. Um, there was a period of time I was trying to convince the team that we should express this in PSI, um, but no one really signed up for it. I thought that would be great. We could have documentation that your virtual machine should be kept at an average PSI of 35, except if it's warm. Uh, <laughs> the, the final concept that, that we have, I want to discuss before we jump into the demo is that of the memory buffer. So we allow you to configure a memory buffer for the virtual machine. And we do this for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first one is, like, how many people out here like to keep their systems configured with only just enough memory so that they're right on the red line at all times? No one? I'm surprised. No, you don't do that. <laughs> you, know, you give your systems a little bit of breathing space. And this is essentially what the memory buffer is. You know, it's, we calculate what the red line number is, and then we give it a little bit more. Uh, and that little bit more uh, is primarily used for two reasons. The first reason is, as I mentioned, we do the, the uh, memory balancing once every second. And we all know that you know, an app could start in that one second window, and the memory buffer allows that app to start and it gives it some memory to run so that when the next second rolls around and we reevaluate, you're not in a bad position. The other reason is there are applications that benefit from having large amounts of free memories that, that Windows uses as a file cache. Now, if you've been tracking memory usage in recent versions of Windows, you know that these days, Windows uses all free memory as a file cache. Um, and if you're running a workload uh, like a web server or a file server, there's a good benefit to saying, look, you know, whatever you think this virtual machine needs, give it, you know, some pad on top so it can use that as a file cache. So now I'm going to switch over to my demo system.
machines, and I have them relatively conservatively configured with a gig of RAM each. Um, I have seven running. This is an eight gig box. Hyper-V needs some memory of its own, so we're now pretty much out of memory. And uh, if I go and try and start the eighth virtual machine, very quickly it's going to fail and come up and tell me, you're out of memory. So now I'm going to run my magical script, uh, which is going to turn all these virtual machines uh, into uh, dynamic memory enabled virtual machines. And what it's actually going to do is it's going to take them from virtual machines which are configured with uh, one gig of RAM and it's going to turn them into virtual machines with dynamic memory enabled. And now instead of having just a single memory figure, we have two. We have a startup value and we have a maximum. Um, so these virtual machines are going to be configured with a startup value of 384 meg and a maximum of two gig. So the first thing you'll see once it gets past the little restoring bit is that I'm now going to be running 12 virtual machines where before I was only running seven. So we're almost there. So I'll uh, go and start bringing up the, the settings for this first virtual machine so I can talk about the dynamic memory settings. Um, let's minimize that. So you can see I now have 12 virtual machines running uh, on this system. And throughout this demo, what you're actually going to see is you're going to see the memory available column and the current memory column just subtly changing as applications are opening and closing inside the virtual machines and we're moving the memory around. Um, if I bring up these settings, so there are a couple of things to show on this page. Uh, the first thing is the, the static versus the dynamic option. And this is just to highlight that it's fully supported to run some static virtual machines and some dynamic memory virtual machines. I have a system at home where uh, one of the virtual machines on it is a Linux virtual machine. We don't support dynamic memory on Linux, so it runs with a static configuration. Other virtual machines in the system uh, run with a dynamic uh, configuration. And here are the, the startup and the maximum uh, memory values that I mentioned. Um, now, you can only change these when the virtual machine is off. I know that at least a handful of you will come up to me afterwards and say, you go, let me change them at any time. Um, I'm aware of that. <laughs> but at the moment, you can only change them while the virtual machine's off. While the virtual machine's running, we do allow you to change the memory buffer and the memory priority settings. And I'd just like to take a moment to, to jump back and so an interesting thing to highlight here is if I jump into my virtual machine, you'll see that my script's still running, we're still opening and closing documents, and the virtual machine itself is still pretty responsive. Um, and to highlight, though, this virtual machine's now running with 559. It was 514 when I started to say that word. Um, with 559 meg of memory, whereas before it had a gig of memory. Um, the next thing I'd like to, to demo a little bit is the memory priority. So this I, I like to do because I like to say, oh, look, it's my web page that just came up. Um, now, you can imagine, you know, I'm running my, my VDI pilot. Let's say this first virtual machine uh, actually belongs to my boss. And I want him to have a good experience. So I'm going to set his memory priority high. And what this is going to do is it's just going to make the memory balancer assign more memory to this virtual machine compared to the other. So you can see very quickly the memory available went from 7% to 19%, and everyone else's just went down. Now, on the flip side, if my boss gives me a bad performance review and I don't want him to have a good day, I can say, okay, you're going to get a low priority, and uh, you'll see equally quickly memory gets pulled out of that virtual machine and assigned elsewhere. Now, I need to remember to set this back, because last time I did this demo, I left the memory priority alone. Um, so at this stage, I'd like to, to take a quick aside and talk about some of the performance counters we have for dynamic memory. Um, because one of the questions that we quite often get is, OK, I've got this. How do I monitor my system and know that everything's good? Uh, and thankfully, we provide a whole bunch of performance counters um, that allow you to have a huge amount of insight. But this is actually my, fa my favorite performance counter. And if you're running a dynamic memory enabled system, it should be your favorite performance counter too. Uh, and it's one performance counter we have uh, that is, uh, it's 
on the, we have two objects uh, in the performance counts. We have Hyper-V dynamic memory and Hyper-V dynamic memory balancer. Uh, the counters on the balancer are counters that apply to the whole system. And this counter is the average pressure counter. And what that tells you is it tells you what the average pressure of all the running virtual machines on your system is. So ideally, I'm running the system a bit too hot. Ideally, you want this to be at 80 or lower. Um, if you're between 80 and 100, you're kind of in the, yeah, let's not push this system too far zone. Uh, if you go over 100, I can guarantee you, you will have user complaints. Uh, because if you go over 100, what we're saying is that on average, your virtual machines don't have all the memory they need. On average, your virtual machines are now paging. Um, so with that in mind, let's push my average over 100. So this is my, my final part of the demo, which usually uh, causes my laptop to melt down ever so slightly. Um, and then I'm going to try and start the last four virtual machines. And uh, there are a couple of things to highlight here. The first thing is, they're going to start. And that's pretty impressive. You know, this is a system that before could only run seven virtual machines. But the next thing to highlight is you're going to see all my memory available column go into the negative. And you may be wondering, what the heck does that mean? And what that means is that, simply put, these virtual machines now have less memory than we believe they need. Um, so each of these virtual machines is going down and so, for instance, if I take my first virtual machine, it's got 420 meg of memory, uh, but we believe it needs about 600 meg of memory. So we're saying it's at negative 32%. And this is, this is always the fun part of my demo, because here's where my system gets kind of slow. So I have to be careful, otherwise I get uh, embarrassing pauses, which I have to talk over. Um, and of course, this is always when it tries to open documents. So the thing I'd like to highlight here uh, is to look at what's happening inside this virtual, first virtual machine. So the first thing, and this is, this is unfortunate, uh, unfortunate and annoying and something we'd like to address in the future, but you can see at the top, we know this virtual machine has 420 meg of memory, but down here, it believes it has 677. And the reason why Toss Manager is reporting that is because we're using a ballooning driver to remove memory instead of doing a fully enlightened remove of memory. So at this stage, what Windows inside this virtual machine believes is it believes I've got 677 meg of memory, and there's this really annoying kernel driver that's sitting on 250 meg of memory, and it's not giving it up no matter how much I ask. Um, so that's, that's an unfortunate artifact of uh, the, the memory ballooning. And what that essentially means is that the total memory that you see in Task Manager now is basically a, a high watermark for the highest level that this virtual machine's been at. Um, the other thing I would like to highlight, though, is, oh, we've got a bit more memory. We're now, we're up from 420 to 440. We're saying this system needs just over 600 meg of memory at the moment, but it only has 440. And yet, if I come into Task Manager, it's telling me that it's kept 94 meg available, 92 meg, 89. <laughs> um, but it's kept a chunk of memory available that it's using as a file cache. The reason why it does that is because the Windows Memory Manager is well designed. It knows that even though I don't have enough memory, that if I want to give a good experience for the user, if I want to still be responsive to user interaction, I'm not going to let my apps use every last meg of memory. I'm going to keep a portion of that memory aside to act as a file cache, to be there so that when the user opens a new window, I can try and be as responsive as possible. And uh, before I leave this demo, I'll just jump back and say, yeah, you'll see my, uh, my average pressure at the moment. Last was uh, 125, and that's, that's a big red sign. That's saying, mm, performance bad. So I'm now going to uh, run my script to try and get my laptop to cool down a little while I uh, jump back to the presentation. So there are a couple of kind of ancillary system impacts uh, to dynamic memory. Um, the first one is we've had to make some changes to uh, what we call the root reserve or the parent reserve. And the idea here is that 
it's important to leave enough memory for the parent partition so that the Hyper-V components in the parent partition can do their job. Uh, if you don't leave enough memory in the parent partition, uh, you can start too many virtual machines and performance will go down the drain. Now, we have the concept of a parent memory reserve today. Frankly, it's not very good. In fact, I can guarantee that pretty much everyone here who's played with Hyper-V has had the experience of starting one virtual machine too many and having the system bog down and go really slow and go, whoa, turn off that last virtual machine and the performance comes back and you tweak the memory a little and you get it just right. Most people I talk to have had that experience. Now, dynamic memory makes that story a bit problematic because now if you turn off that last virtual machine, it just means all your other virtual machines can grow up to use the memory. Um, so we've done a bunch of work uh, in the Surface Pack 1 to make our, uh, our memory reserve a more appropriate value for a wider range of systems. Now that said, it's not always going to be perfect. And it's not always going to be perfect for a couple of reasons. The first one um, is that we spent a lot of time debating where to draw the line. Because one side of the line says, mm, we let you push things a bit too far, and sometimes performance gets a bit slow, but you can run more virtual machines. The other side of the line says, no, we always make sure all the performance is good, but maybe you can't run as many virtual machines as you used to. Um, and we debated back and forth a lot over that, and we kind of ended up in the middle. So I know that there are going to be systems out there where you're going to deploy Service Pack 1, and if you don't enable dynamic memory, you may not be able to start that last virtual machine that you used to be able to run because you're right on the boundary of memory. Similarly, I know there are going to be systems out there that with dynamic memory enabled, we're going to push things a little bit too hard. Um, the other thing to consider here is if you are not following the best practices, and you are running other workloads inside the parent partition, that's also going to increase the memory needed for the parent partition. So for all these reasons, uh, we act, we're going to be providing and supporting this documented register key where if, if this register key isn't there and it isn't there by default, we calculate our own value for a memory reserve. But you can go in there specify this register key and just put in a static value and say, you know, always keep two gig of memory uh, aside for the parent partition. Um, so actually something, I, I tweak this key heavily on all my demo systems because as you saw, I push them pretty hard. So I, I like to, uh, you know, get this tuned as finely as possible. The other uh, change that we've made is to how we manage NUMA. Now, in my experience, uh, I would say, and I won't ask for a show of hands, but I'll say about 10-15% of the people here know what NUMA is, and they hate NUMA. Uh, and the rest of you don't know what NUMA is, and that is fine. You are in happy, blissful ignorance. Um, so I'm not going to go into much detail on this because of that, but I will say dynamic memory does have impacts on NUMA systems because since we're adding and removing memory, there is a higher tendency for virtual machines to end up spanning NUMA nodes. Um, if you have a low NUMA ratio, not a big deal. And most systems these days do have low NUMA ratios, and so this all just works. If you have a system which has a high NUMA ratio, these are usually your big end boxes, your top IBMs, your 64-way you know, HP. They usually have high NUMA ratios. If you're working with one of those systems and you're seeing a performance issue, we now provide in the UI uh, a setting on the Hyper-V settings where you can just say, mm, no virtual machine span NUMA node, please. Uh, the downside of that is you're not going to get the, the sort of consolidation and the complete flexibility that you would get. The upside is it guarantees performance. Um, so that's all I'm going to say on that. So now I'd like to, to shift gears a bit um, and uh, talk about some of the different memory techniques out there and talk about what our competition has been doing and what we've been looking at doing. And uh, I'll be completely honest, uh, when I first started working on this presentation, there was part of me that was like, you know, I don't want to be that guy who gets up there and does nothing but talk about his competition. Um, and part of me was actually tempted to, uh, to try and do this whole presentation without talking about VMware. But I thought, one, no, that's not the right thing for me to do. And two, if I don't do it, you guys are going to just flame me alive in the question and answer. Uh, so 
There are a couple of things I'd like to talk about uh, and, and kind of address. The, the first thing to talk about uh, when looking at competition is I personally have this approach to competitive analysis where the first thing that I start with is I assume that my competitor is just as smart as me. And that's actually a big step to take because there are a lot of people in this industry who when they see their competitor doing something different, they're like, ha, well, that's because they're idiots. Um, and it's never a good idea. So I assume that they're just as smart as me. So with that assumption, when I see a competitor doing something different, there are kind of one or two conclusions I can come to. The first one is maybe they know something I don't. And hopefully that's never the case. Uh, but that's always the first thing I go looking for is, is there some piece of information that I'm missing? And once I've kind of ferreted that out, the next thing I look for is, are they making different assumptions to me? Are they placing different restrictions on themselves to what I'm placing on myself that's causing them to go down a different path? And more often than not, that's the, that's the interesting path, uh, part of logic. So I actually spent... I spent a lot of time uh, talking to VMware customers. I spent a lot of time reading VMware documents. And whenever I can, I spend a lot of time talking to uh, VMware employees, employees, both present and past, so I can try and understand what's, what's driving the thinking here. And I came across some key interesting uh, you know, items when looking in the area of memory management. The first one is that. Microsoft and VMware have a very different philosophy to how they view the guest operating system. To Microsoft, the fact of the matter is, most of the time people running Hyper-V, what they're running inside the virtual machine is Windows. And we know Windows. And not only do we know Windows, we can change Windows. It's our baby. Uh, and not only do we know Windows, but literally, the guy who is head of the Windows memory manager is in the same building as the Hyper-V team. So if I see something weird, I can walk down the hall and knock on his door and go, what the hell is going on? So we can, when we looked at this, we started from an assumption of, OK, we're going to learn everything we can about the guest operating system, and we're going to build a system that is built on our knowledge of how the Windows memory manager works and our knowledge of the information we can get out of the Windows Memory Manager, and when we ended up going down the enlightened path as far as going, and we're going to build a system based on the changes that we're going to go in and make to the Windows Memory Manager in order to make this system work. Now, on the flip side, VMware doesn't own the guest operating system. They never own the guest operating system. And they go in with an assumption that, eh, even if the guest operating system has counters, we don't know if they're accurate. We don't know if they're trustworthy. Uh, and fair enough, some of the counters inside uh, guest operating systems aren't accurate and trustworthy. So they go in and go, we're going to build a system that treats the virtual machine like a black box. And instead, we're going to heuristically analyze uh, what's happening at the lowest level. Um, now, that has an advantage in that it works with any guest operating system, but it has some big disadvantages in that it's a lot harder to do, and it's a lot more complicated, and it's a lot easier to get things wrong. Um, the second thing, which I'll just point out, I know that there are two Microsoft people up the back, and you're not allowed to let marketing know that I'm saying this, because they always get a little bent out of shape uh, when I say this. The simple fact of the matter is that this is an area where we have second mover advantage. You know, VMware's been out there. We've been able to see what has and hasn't worked for them. And we've been able to look at all these techniques and go, which one makes the most sense? Which one gets the best return on investment? Uh, on the other hand, VMware went down a path with, frankly, we think is the worst path possible, which is they started out with swapping at the hypervisor level. And a lot of their techniques have been developed around the concept of, wow, swapping is a really bad idea. What can we do to minimize this swapping that's happening in the virtual machines? The next thing before I jump into the techniques is to kind of address an you know, interesting elephant in the room, uh, is that everyone knows that for the last couple of years, 
uh, Microsoft's been saying memory overcommit is a bad thing. Uh, and in fact, I'm sure that if I didn't address this, that there would be people, and there already have been people who'd come up to me and go, hey, you've been saying memory overcommit's a bad thing, and now you're going to do that Microsoft thing where you say your competitor's feature is a bad thing until you do it, and then you turn around and say it's now a good thing, and I caught you. Um, so I will try and rebut that a little by saying, no, we still believe memory overcommit is a bad thing. Specifically, overcommitting any resource is a bad thing. And here we draw a line between memory overcommit and memory oversubscription. Um, we, you know, we make sure with our system that the virtual machine knows what memory it has. And as you saw, I just stood there and said, look, memory pressure gets above 100%. Your virtual machines need more memory than they have. That's a bad thing. And that's the transition between oversubscription and overcommitment. And there are two little stories I like to use to illustrate this. The first one is to, OK, let's think about another resource that we talk about where oversubscription is OK, but overcommitment's a problem. And that'd be CPU. So imagine you knew someone. They had 10 servers averaging 5% CPU load. They took those 10 servers, consolidated them onto a single box using virtualization. There's a little bit of virtualization overhead, and the average is now 60% CPU load. That system's oversubscribed. You know, yeah, you know, if multiple of those servers spike at the same time, they won't get uh, what they need. But for the most part, it runs along happily. The person's happy with virtualization. They just saved a bunch of money. Everything's good. Now, on the flip side, Let's imagine that those 10 source virtual machines had been running at 25% CPU utilization on average. And you consolidated them onto a single box that's now well and truly overcommitted. Well, performance is going to suck. That person's going to hate virtualization. They're going to rip it out, and they're going go to uh, go back to physical computers. The simpler story still that I like to use is oversubscription is where the airline sells more tickets than they have seats. Overcommitment is when everyone turns up on a Sunday afternoon. So oversubscription, fine, but overcommitment is a bad idea. So now let's talk about some of the techniques uh, that uh, get discussed. And the first obvious one to talk about uh, is page sharing. And uh, I often joke that, that page sharing is kind of uh, VMware's golden-haired child of memory management, and that any time you talk to a VMware person about memory management, the first thing they bring out is like, hey, we do page sharing, and that's really cool. Um, so we actually spent a lot of time looking at page sharing. In fact, I have pretty much lost track of the number of prototypes and performance analysis that I've seen uh, about page sharing. Um, and before I get into some of these details, uh, the first key point to make is that once you have sized a system correctly using the techniques of dynamic memory, while page sharing does get you more memory out, it's not a huge amount. It's usually in the ballpark of 10 to 20 percent. And sure, you know, one day we might do that. Uh, but you know, as a first step, dynamic memory, adding or removing memory, gets you the biggest bang for the buck. The next thing is, and this is kind of interesting. In order to do page sharing, the, the concept is basically you find duplicate pages of memory, and you make a single copy of them on the back end. That sounds very simple, but finding duplicate pages of memory is a very hard task. Uh, it's very hard, and it's also very uh, compute intensive. Uh, what you have to do is you have to pass through all the memory in all your virtual machines, and you have to generate hashes of all the pages of memory. And once you've got the hashes, you have to compare the hashes. And once you've found a hash match, you have to go through and you have to do a bit-by-bit -bit comparison of the page in order to make sure they are 100% identical. And then you can single source them. Now, that uses a lot of CPU. And the way VMware mitigates this in their system is they do it very slowly. Um, in fact, uh, default installation of uh, ESX uh, 4.0 uh, is configured to try and iterate over all the memory on, on the system uh, to identify candidate pages for sharing once every 10 hours. So what this means is this is not a dynamic solution. 
This is not the solution that if you have a spike in workload, it gets your workload now. Um, what we've seen through our testing of VMware is that where this comes in most effective is if you have truly idle systems that are sitting there doing nothing for hours and hours, if not days and days. Um, and that's not really where we want to focus. We want to focus on a system that works for, you know, running workloads. Um, there are some other details. I'm not going to go into to great length on those because we're running out of time. Uh, but I highly recommend you go and read the, the virtualization team blog, which goes into further details on some of the things that we saw with page sharing. Um, the next thing is second level paging. And once again, you know, I've mentioned this is kind of, this is where you have a page file run in the virtualization layer um, that backs the memory to disk. And there are many, many things wrong with this. The biggest thing to, to point out is the problem with any system that does uh, paging at the virtualization layer is that unlike paging that happens inside the virtual machine, the virtualization layer doesn't know what's actually happening with that specific chunk of memory. And so this means like you can do things like you can have kernel resources paged out because the virtualization layer doesn't know that that's a kernel resource for a virtual machine. Or my favorite one, uh, you can have a situation where the virtualization layer pages out a block of memory. Guest operating system doesn't know that it's paged out. So the guest operating system decides it's going to page out that block of memory. And when that happens, it goes to read the block of memory. So the virtualization layer pages it in. It reads it, and then it pages it out inside the virtual machine. And you get this great little you know, paging dance back and forth. Uh, uh, now, all that said, there is one upside for virtualization paging, and that is it always works. You know, disk is always there. But there are many problems with this approach. And there are other techniques that, are, that have been discussed recently. Uh, if you follow VMware, you're probably aware that they've been talking about their memory compression. Uh, I've been following this with kind of some interesting amusement because uh, I've actually been working on virtualization for just under 10 years now, and I originally worked at Connectix, which was the company that Microsoft acquired for virtualization. Now, let me do a pop quiz on the room. Who knows about the memory product that Connectix did? Do we have anyone here who knows? I, I see two hands up there. Tell me the name. Yep, RAM Doubler. So RAM Doubler was a, a product for the Mac that Kinectix did a long time ago. And RAM Doubler was actually, simply put, a memory compression program. Um, now, what most people who know RAM Doubler know it as a, as a product for Mac OS 9. It was great. I, personally, I could never use Mac OS 9 unless RAM Doubler was installed. Um, what they don't know is that Kinectix also did a version of RAM Doubler for Windows 3.1. Um, and what no one knows beyond that, apart from uh, ex connectix employees, is that we were asked every day to do RAM doubler for Mac OS X and to do RAM doubler for Windows NT. And we never did it simply because when we looked at these systems, their memory managers were sufficient that doing memory compression on the fly didn't actually buy you much. Uh, and those, produ those products wouldn't have given you the benefit that it gave you on Mac OS 9. Um, so we saw this and we went, ah, that's going to be interesting. Um, now, VMware, since announcing it, has come out with a, a, a lot of interesting details. And kind of getting back to my first point of a lot of VMware's techniques are about digging out of the hole of uh, second level paging. Um, the way they've actually implemented the, the memory compression is just a way to uh, reduce paging uh, when it happens at the virtualization layer. Um, so the memory compression only gets engaged once you have a second level page file around and in action. But anyway, all of this to say, one of the things that I did want to highlight through this discussion was that one, even though Microsoft is only now coming out and talking about dynamic memory, this has been something that we've been working on for years. This has been something that, you know, it's not a case of, well, this was the easiest thing to do, so this is what we did. But instead, we've spent a lot of time looking at all the different techniques and trying to understand them and figure out which one made the most sense. And this is going to be an area where 
we're going to continue to work. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if in a couple of years' time I'm out here talking about some new memory management technique that we're doing uh, in Hyper-V, but once again, all focused on trying to address the customer needs um, and get the best uh, virtualization platform out there. So at this stage, what next? Well, my biggest ask is try the beta out. We have this in beta at the moment. This is in Service Pack 1. It's available for download. Try it out. Let us know how it works. Like, if anyone in this room comes to me one week after SP1 RTMs and says, hey, I tried dynamic memory out for the first time, and I think I found a problem, I will slap you. <laughs> Try it out now. If you, tell, if you find a problem now and tell us about it, we can actually fix it. Um, now, that said, we've had, heard a lot of feedback, uh, good feedback. Uh, most of the feedback we've heard is basically, I've turned it on, and it seems to work the way you said it would work. Um, and that's great feedback to hear. But absolutely, get the beta and try it on any workload. Don't go in there with you know, preconceived, oh, it's not going to work well for this workload, or I'm only going to use it on this workload. Hey, if you have a workload where you think it's not going to work well, try that workload first. Uh, let us know. Um, so that's my biggest ask. And uh, I'd like to, we'll head over question and answer. We've got a couple of minutes left. So at first, I'd like to thank you all for coming to my session. Um, I'll take questions, and after this, I'll be down in the expo hall uh, at the welcome drinks. Uh, to the people sneaking out the doors, make sure you fill out evaluation forms, please. Uh, but questions? Really still slow compared to memory. Uh, memory these days, and most people haven't really got their mind around just how fast memory is these days. Um, one of my favorite little stories about this is, uh, and this was, this was ages ago, this was actually back when I was working at Connectix. Uh, in 2002, I was working on a test lab, and uh, I put together a bunch of systems, and I, was, uh, I decided to run mem test on them to burn them in. And if you've ever run MemTest, you, see it, you know it reports a bunch of stats about the system. And there was something that caught my eye, and that was I had, uh, I had an old Pentium 2 system sitting next to an a Athlon system with a DDR memory. And DDR memory is as fast as the L2 cache on a Pentium 2. Um, so memory this, these days is just insanely fast. And no, like SSDs are much faster than spinning media. Don't get me wrong on that. But they don't come anywhere near uh, you know, a system running top-end DDR3. Uh, and we're still talking factors of 100x or greater off. Um, so yeah. <laughs> what about SQL in a VM? You're an evil man. I'll just point out. I'll just point out that that was Kenan from Microsoft asking that question. Thank you, Kenan from Microsoft. Uh, <laughs> that is a good question. The, 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 the top answer to this is we are working actively with all the Microsoft workload teams for them to come up with guidance around dynamic memory. The more detailed answer, uh, because everyone likes to kind of wheel out SQL and go, well, this isn't going to work. Um, it actually does work, and it works quite well. Uh, there are a couple of things to be aware of. The first one is that in order to get the best performance, and this makes the SQL guys happy, you need to be running the Enterprise or Better Edition, uh, because the uh, Standard Edition, does, they didn't do any support for uh, understanding hot out of memory on a physical box. Um, but SQL is uh, notoriously known in server admin circles for being that workload that chews up incredible amounts of memory. Um, and uh, when we spent time working with the SQL team on this, we discovered that reputation was a bit of a misnomer, uh, because SQL does have uh, logic in it that checks to see, hey, is the system running low on memory? And if it's running low on memory, should I back off? Uh, the problem is that that logic only kicks in when the system is literally close to its last gasp on memory. Uh, thankfully, we have a configurable memory buffer. Um, and what we've found in testing with the SQL team is that if you set up your virtual machine and you set the memory buffer to the lowest value we support, which is 5%, uh, 
uh, you will actually see your SQL VM grow and shrink appropriately uh, with workload. Um, so that's actually one, we've got the, the SQL team signed up to provide that documentation by the time we RTM uh, service pack one. But so as I, get, as I said, try it out with all workloads. So the, the question is, if you have a large amount of memory movement, so a, a virtual machine goes up to 6 gig and then down to 500 meg, is that going to mess up memory management inside the virtual machine? The short answer is no. Uh, the long answer is, yeah, there were a lot of issues, and we have spent a long time working with the Windows kernel guys in order to get fixes into the memory manager um, in order to make sure that the answer to that is no you would be, uh, you probably wouldn't be amazed, but you should be amazed at some of the, the issues that we came across. Um, and as I said, this has been something that's been a long time in the coming, and a, a large chunk of that time has been uh, working through uh, just those sorts of issues. Um, there, there are going to be a couple of things that we're going to be documenting. Um, the, the issues that we know about now are kind of, we're keeping our fingers crossed that they're going to be edge case enough. My favorite one is that there's a, and I just mentioned uh, SQL, there's a bug in SQL, but you only hit this bug if you manage to add over 16 times the amount of original memory. Um, fairly easy to avoid that through configuration. And that, but we, there'll be a prob uh, probably be a couple of issues like that, but for the most part, uh, we believe it'll all just work. So I'm going to wrap up here. We're a couple of minutes over. And as I said, I'm going to be heading down to the Welcome Expo Hall. So feel free to come by and ask me your questions there.